Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz musician, composer, and visual artist, Gerald Cannon. Born in Racine, Wisconsin, his father Benjamin was a guitarist and bought him his first electric bass at the age of 10. From there, he went on to the University of Wisconsin, where he met jazz great Milt Hinton, and it changed his life. He's on the heels of releasing 2017 CD combinations, and his life is a string of dreams realized, a lot of combinations that worked out. He went on to New York City at the age of 28, and since then he has played with the likes of Art Blakey's Jazz Messengers, Dexter Gordon, Cedar Walton's Trio, Jimmy Smith, and so many others. He's quite an accomplished painter. He's got great stories, so please get to know him and dig this interview, my friends. Gerald, hey, thank you for taking some time out for me. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. So let's go ahead and start off here, your latest album, combinations okay. talk to me this is a great album um i've really enjoyed listening to it but from your perspective how do you feel about this new album well I, you know i'm very excited um about this record i you know i was blessed enough to get you know everybody that i uh wanted on the record and it's been uh 13 14 years from my first record to this one and it's doing very very well and i'm just I don't know. I'm excited. So with that in mind, you know, 13, 14 years since the first one, what is your philosophy? What is your overriding goal when you release a new album? Is it kind of an evolution for you, or is it that time in your life? How do you approach a new album? I have so much time in between records that I've had like a many, many over 30 years um, different you know, ideas for our record. And on this particular record, when uh, it came up that I could do this, I just wanted to do a record that, you know, people could listen to and pat their feet to and really enjoy and not have to think so much, but, you know, feel more than anything. I didn't want yeah. it to be too complicated, you know? Sure. I just wanted it to feel really, really good. I guess that's one of the ideas behind music in general is to just lose yourself for a little while, kind of like a good movie. Yeah, you know, I kind of wanted to um, express myself a little bit more as a soloist on this record, as a composer. Let me get back to the beginnings of your life in Racine, Wisconsin, and uh-huh. you start out at 10 playing bass in your father's group, The Gospel Expressions. Yeah. So music obviously started early on for you, but how did this morph into jazz? Well, you know, I was very lucky. My parents, my father was a deacon of a Baptist church. And so, um, and he always had gospel quartets when I was a kid. The first one was the Golden True Life. Actually, that's the first quartet that I played with. And that consisted of my two of my uncles. My dad played guitar and sang. My Uncle George sang the bass. They didn't have electric basses. Well, they had electric basses, but they didn't have, you know, traditional gospel quartets. They weren't quite using electric basses at that time. This is in the um, late 60s, early 70s, you know. And so, you know, I would hear my uncle sing these bass notes that, you know, when I was a kid, I'd go and hear him, and I, that's basically what I heard most of the time <laughs> was him, you know. Yeah. And uh, he had a different approach. His notes were, were always root notes, you know. And I don't know, for some reason, that just stuck out in my, you know, in my head. It's very influential throughout my whole career, even now. I still hear his notes from Uncle George. Right on. Yeah. And my, but my parents, we listened to gospel music, jazz, and the blues in our house all my life, you know. I grew up listening to Nat King Cole, and one of my dad's favorite records was, uh, I think it's Midnight Blue with Kenny Burrell. I still have the original vinyl that he had. And so one of the first bass players that I heard was Major Holly on that record. Yeah. You know? And your education in your life just got ramped up more and more. You went to the University of Wisconsin and mm-hmm. uh, met Milt Hinton. What was yeah. that like? What, what kind of experience was that like? Well, that was, that was like the turning point in my life because I went to the Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin across to be a gym teacher and, and I, to play basketball for them because I was kind of a jock in high school. I just took double bass, acoustic bass as an elective because I was going to be, like I said, I was going to be a gym teacher. So, hmm. you know, I've always been interested in the upright bass ever since I can remember. And 
I got the opportunity to just take it as an elective, and my teacher, Linda Brewer, thought I was pretty good at it. You know, she said, hey, you know, there's this guy in town, his name is Milt Tinton for the jazz stuff. I want you to come and hear him and meet him. So I went to see Milt Tinton play, and it just blew me away. First of all, you know, I was studying classical bass up there, so I didn't really realize that the uh, double bass could be so much fun and so important. I didn't know how important it was in the rhythm section at that time. And Milt was just, you know, you know, it was Milt Tinton. He was playing it the daylight out of the bass, and, um, you know, and I got a chance to talk to him after his concert. And uh, I remember he said, you know, your teacher says you're pretty good, you know. We need more bass players. You should think about, you know, transferring to a conservatory. And so he gave me a space, and I played a few little things on it. He's like, yeah, you definitely should. And so that next semester, I was off to the Wisconsin Conservatory of Music. You know, the one thing that's been very integral in your development as an artist is painting. And yes. I want to know... Um, and I love your work. It's great stuff. Um, Thank you. And, yeah, you bet. And what, the one thing that I, I find interesting when the creative brain gets diversified in that way, how has your love and act of painting enhanced your playing as a musician? You know, it's funny. I, uh, that's a good question. I, I've been painting probably as long as I've been playing the bass because I've always painted in, in, when I was a kid. I was always drawing. I was, you know doing both, you know. Um, but I found out in my later years that, because I always tried to keep them separate because I didn't want to be known as one of these musicians that paint. I take them both equally as serious, you know. You know, but I found out later, they, they both influence each other. My bass lines are kind of influenced by my painting because, you know, bass players play colors, you know. Yeah. And... Um, and I find that they both interact with each other, you know. I have to do both, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. at some point. Yeah. Some days I paint, some days I play the bass, you know. That's cool. I dig it. Yeah. I, I'm actually in the visual arts myself, and I tend to keep both of those separated, but I understand how both of those ids equally feed into that entire creative ego that you have. So yeah, um, I dig it. So well, actually, point... they're both humbling. That's the yeah. thing. You know, yeah. they're, they're, um, they kind of keep my ego in check, you know. I mean, especially painting because it's something that I'm, I'm a little shy about. You know, I'm like not as shy as I was because it was like my little personal little <laughs> secret thing that I kept from other musicians and <laughs> kept out of the way of music. And But now it's, it's, all, it's all related, man. You know, it's, fu it's funny, especially for the male brain. There's a level of us that, you know, we don't, we, we don't open up as much. Right. Um, and I think there's a part of me that sees painting as pulling that part out of me that could be manifested in much more detrimental ways. So, right. I, you know, I see that you get it out and you're getting it out in a very effective way. And what a what a nice way to take that moment and memory that you've made that someone wants to relive for years and years on their wall. That's I think that's the right. ultimate form of being humble right there is that someone wants to experience that creative spark that you have and it gives their life sunlight, you know? Right. So, yeah, yeah. There's something very cool about that. And that's the difference, you know, like, you know, you go to a concert and you hear a band play, okay, that's it. They're never going to play that the same way again. Yeah. A jazz band, you know, but like a painting, you paint, and especially an abstract painting, you can look at it a thousand times to see something different in it, but you, uh -huh. you get to keep looking at it. That's yep. the thing, you know. So it, It's like the ultimate good cloud day. It's like one way or another yeah. you're going to get everybody pointing up, and they're going to be like, yeah, that's that, that's that. So, yeah, exactly. It's cool. It yeah. morphs yeah. on its own. So at the age of 28, you arrive in New York City, and uh -huh. you're, you're playing in the subway. You're in the, you're in the hub of jazz. What was that yeah. like? How exciting and thrilling was that? Oh, I was coming from Racine, Wisconsin. Oh, my <laughs> God. It was like, you know, it's funny. I've always wanted to live in New York, you know, even when I was a kid. The first book I read was The Lords of Flatbush when I was about yeah. 12, and I was like, I want to live in New York, you know. <laughs> Everybody lives in an apartment. Everybody here lives in houses, you know. But that was such an exciting time. Oh, my God. I, you know, but the first band that I saw was George Coleman and Ron Carter 
And I was just like, I got so overwhelmed, I fainted. Wow. <laughs> I had to go outside, and I fainted right on the street. It was like, I was just, I, never, I mean, you know, I used to go to Chicago all the time for the Jazz Showcase to see all the guys coming in. But just to be in the city and the excitement and the energy. Plus, you know, back then it was different. I mean, right away I, I got connected with a few guys that had just got to town, and we were just hitting every jam session and, you know, and begging, sneaking in clubs and standing for <laughs> Standing out by the heating vents at the at the village gate because we couldn't sneak in there to hear Art Blakey and and uh, oh, it was wonderful, you know. And we have these jam sessions, you know, that were like really like you know, I don't know. They were great because we would play standards, you know, and we would like talk about them and we would sit and listen to Kenny Dorham all night, you know. It was just beautiful. You know, I hear these stories periodically about people that see musicians like that. Like I was interviewing someone last week that said, yeah, I went in the city and caught Monk and Miles. I would do what you did. I would come out and I would be like, are you kidding me? And I would just fall down. I mean, if I yeah. had the chance to see any of those guys live for a little bit, and that <laughs> it's mind blowing to me. Yeah. I mean, that <laughs> it was, you know, the cradle, it's the hub, you know, yeah. So, yeah, the skyscrapers and it's, it's the summer, you know, there's there's no wind and it's so hot and I just saw the greatest band I've ever seen in my <laughs> life. I went outside and bam. <laughs> Man, that's, I, I love that. You know, yeah. and the beauty of what your story is, is just going from feigning to dream realized. You know, you've got the chance to jam yeah. with some of these legends, you know, Dexter Gordon, Cedar Walton, yeah. you know, Jimmy Smith. So let me ask you this. What did what did you take from these legendary towering personas and musicians that have helped you not only stay centered as a musician, but to teach younger cats around you the way they taught you? Well, you know, I tell you, I, I have been so blessed to have uh, been able to play with a lot of musicians, great musicians that aren't here anymore. You know, I played with Art Blakey, did a few gigs with him. I did a couple gigs with Dexter Gordon. I played with Cedar Walton and Billy Higgins' trio for a week in Minneapolis. And my time with um, with Roy Hargrove, my 10 years with him, and, you know, Elvin Jones. Man, you know, each one of those guys, you know, well, first of all, with Art Blakey, I just learned that, you know, I, you know, it's just you just have to, like, put your feelings to the side and get over it and do the job, <laughs> you know? <laughs> You can't really be nervous. I mean, you can be nervous, but you still got to do the job, you know. But, um, you know, I've learned the most, I think, from um, my time with Elvin Jones because I was in my 40s when I got that gig. At that time, Elvin was kind of like chopping up bass players left and right because he was looking for the right guy, you know. So a lot of guys were coming in and leaving, coming in and leaving, you know. I got the call two days before the gig, you know, so no rehearsal, you know, show up at the Blue Note, let's go. You know, I, it was just a, an amazing experience to play with a drummer of that caliber for so long. You know, I, I learned how to stand on my own two feet. I learned that um, my voice is truly important in the rhythm section, and uh, even a great drummer like Elvin Jones depends on me to be centered and focused. You know, I guess that's the main thing is focusing that I learned from Elvin. And also, those guys were gentlemen, you know. They were, you know, they weren't arrogant you know they weren't cocky i mean if you did something wrong they just tell you do this you know sometimes in a nice way sometimes and not but it was all meant with love and it was they were teachers you know you know the beauty of of being involved with jazz i started this show in 2011 and since i've done that i my goal has been to speak to the jazz musician to garner the history the rich history and story of jazz instead of reading in books I want to get it from you, the musician. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I've been very, very blown away by, and not even in a bad way, is that the, the, the fact that all of the legends and all of the musicians have proverbially, from you to everybody else, have carried this torch of being humble but extremely talented 
and grateful for the history that you've been involved with. In fact, I see a lot of these cats like Sonny Rollins and Dr. Lonnie Smith and all these guys as the mm-hmm. guys in Cloud City and Star Wars. They're the Jazz Jedi Council, and they're right. just up there, and they're dictating the wisdom by which we all live by, and there's something beautiful about it. But I agree. I think there's the, – the thing that's always gotten me about jazz – as I watch this, the evolution of it is, is that it's not this medium that's mass consumed, but there's always this integrity and this joy and this love that, that pulsates in a very humble way. And I, and I love you guys for that. You, you, you really do keep that alive and it's, it's beautiful to see. Yeah. Well, you know, this music is a, is, first of all, it's a gift to be able to do, you know, and I'm, grateful to the creator that I have this gift and that I've been um, able to pass on a few little things that I've learned, you know, from the other, and it's kind of a, it's a privilege to play this. It's not like, cause not everybody can do it. It's not an easy thing to do. You know, it takes a lot of hard work. You have to, you know, be truly dedicated to what you're doing. And, and so you have to keep a certain level of humility to keep the balance right, you know. Yeah. Um, I've seen a lot of musicians come and go in my 30 years in New York or so, mm. you know, and the ones that remain and that stay working are the most humble. <laughs> it's what I've noticed. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. everybody says, no, nah, why you hear a lot of young guys say, like, yeah, he's going to blow up. He's going to blow What is blowing up, man? This is jazz. You know? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. He's blowing up is like being able to work consistently over a number of years. Not always about fame and fortune in this, you know. It's for the love of the music and um, and respect for, you know, for the music and for the people that opened up the doors for us to do this. You know, for me, that's you know, that's how I look at it. And for someone that's had such a, a, it almost appears on paper and even by hearing the timbre of your voice that you almost have to pinch yourself for what's happened over your career and what you've experienced and been on stage with, and. I want to ask you this. Why do you love jazz? Well, you know, it's because it's a freedom. You know, it's a freedom. It's a it's another artistic way for me to express myself in the company of others expressing themselves, you know, and making a big global painting out of whatever we're doing. You know what I mean? It's like sure. I'm like one of the colors to an old, to, to a huge painting, man, that, that, Everybody's painting us like a collaboration, man. You know, it, it's um, and I, I have a voice in that, and I get to to uh, use my voice, which is my bass. You know, and it's just, uh, it's man. I, I do pinch myself. I played two nights ago at the Library of Congress with McCoy Tyner, who I've been with for twelve years, and it was me, McCoy, um, Joe Lovano, and Francisco Mela. And wow. they videotaped it, and it's, it's going to be in the archives at the Library of Congress, you know. Beautiful. And, you know, even though I've been with McCoy 11, 12 years now, every time I sit there, he sits down to play his solo piece, it's like, you know, that's just a whole thing right there for me. It's like, man, this is great. I get to be on stage, standing here, watching McCoy, watching McCoy Tyner create you know, something by himself, and it's different every time. It's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, I learned so much from not. I mean, from I've learned a ton from McCoy being with him that long. But every time he plays a solo, I learn something more. It's like that's how it's done. Yeah, you know, that's Absolutely. professionalism to the highest level. Yeah, you know, and he's so humble. You know, with everybody, and he's humbly, you know, and he's such a, a, a gentleman. You know, he's McCoy Tyner. He doesn't have to be, but yeah. he is, you know, and it's a lot of love there. So let me ask you this. Every, everyone mm-hmm. has a version of who you are, your family, your friends, your fans, business associates. But when you wake up and face today, who do you think you are? Man, I'm just a regular guy, man. Cool. I'm just a, a human being on this earth. That's all. That's been blessed enough that you know lucky enough and I work hard enough that I get to do what I love to do for a living I dig it 
thank you for reaching back out to me. Thank you for being an artistic force in jazz and the world of visual arts, man. It's a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you for having me, and, you know, and happy holidays to you. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Wisconsin, New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Gerald for his cool and his music and all of that time. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.